Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio Detectives, where we bring to you tales from the greatest detective shows the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 126 episodes made, broadcast on NBC Radio from 1955 to 1958, we bring to you X... From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, the time is the late 1960s. The place, Washington, D.C. The story, Honeymoon in Hell. My name is Carmody. I'm a grade one cybernetics man at Western Alliance headquarters in the Pentagon. Used to be a rocket pilot, but they retired me at 27 after I made the third successful flight to the moon. As a grade one cybernetics operator, I get to work with Junior. Let me tell you about Junior. He was built in 1962, and he's the world's finest electronic brain, with a possible exception of Ivan, the Eastern Alliance brain, which was built on stolen plans and modeled after Junior. There are only four men in the country permitted in the same room with Junior because the data we feed him is so secret. One of those four is the president of the Western Alliance. The other three are myself, Charlie Mazur, and the chief. Ray? Oh, yes, chief. Have you got Junior running a problem? Well, I just fed him the hourly data for probability of H-bomb war with the Eastern Alliance. And he's ready. Hold it. According to the data just received, the probability of a hot war between the Western and the Eastern Alliance is 99. 930 in favor of such a war breaking out within the next month. Oh, it doesn't sound good, Chief. Yeah. Well, I'll scramble the data, send it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Meanwhile, here's a priority C civilian problem to run off. Well, oh, what's this stuff? Well, it seems on September 17th, a statistician in the birth record department of New York City noticed that out of 813 births reported that day, 657 have been girls and only 156 have been boys. Well, that sounds impossible. Well, that's what this statistician thought. So they phoned some other cities, and the same trend is being shown, not only in other American cities, but in Western Europe. Sunspots, maybe? That's for Junior to figure out. He's the brain here. Okay, I'll feed him. Give me the results on the intercom. I'll be in my office. Right. I didn't really pay much attention to the problem at the time. As a grade one operative, I was more interested in asking Junior questions on security, ballistics, missiles, rocketry, and so on. The Eastern Alliance would undoubtedly have traded three puppet governments and the tomb of Lenin to have an agent as a grade one operative. But I took the birth statistics and fed them in and waited. Uh, Junior, incidentally, responds to vocal stimuli. Speaks 12 languages. Got the answer, Junior? I have. Okay. The present statistics, if the trend is projected for another day, indicate a definite dangerous imbalance. If the trend is irreversible unless new methods of reproduction are developed, the population of the United States and Western Europe will die out in one and one-half generations. Well, it wasn't long before the newspapers got the story and kicked it around. People in governments really started to worry now. Biologists and laboratories made it their number one project. 
On September 29th, only 41 boys were born in the entire United States. During the month of October, in spite of all the work going on, not a single male child was born anywhere in the world with the exception of one in outer Mongolia and one in Alaska. November drew another blank. I was working 18 hours a day feeding every available scrap of data to Junior. Data insufficient for answer to your question. Well, here's the latest. A new analysis of chromosome structure indicates the presence of an additional electron in the orbit of the Y atoms for carbon chain X. Now try again. The question is, what is causing the lack of male births? Anything new, Ray? No, not yet. Hold it. Data insufficient. Well, that's it. We've fed Junior every scrap of information that every physicist, geneticist, chemist, and biologist in this half of the world knows, and all he does is say data insufficient. Yeah, well, the operator who had him last night didn't do any better. Uh, any more information on the Eastern Alliance? Have they made any progress? No, but at least the talk of a hot war is dying down. Well, they're still working on a space station, aren't they? Oh, yes, we're both going ahead with that. But, well, this seems to be a common problem now. You know, in spite of hydrogen bombs and ICBMs, people don't really expect the whole race to die out from a war. But the complete lack of male children, now that's something that every family can understand. Has anybody thought of the possibility of some kind of radiation from outer space that's damaging the chromosomes, something our instruments can't detect? Everybody's thought of it. Nobody's proved anything. Well, keep trying, Junior. Maybe he'll come up with something. Okay. Junior. I'm ashamed of you. Answer me. Information recorded. Look, you're a whiz on rocket fuels and space orbits, but when it comes to women, you're a total bust, just like me. I don't understand them and never will. Information recorded. Now, you've convinced us that if we use the H-bombs in total war, both sides will lose, and we know that your counterpart at Moscow University has given the same information to the Eastern Alliance. That you can figure out. But women... You can't have genetics without women, right? No. Well, you know that much. Uh -huh. What about that blonde at the party last night, huh? What about her? The question is inadequately worded. Please clarify. Did I see her again? No. What? You haven't even got any data on her. Why shouldn't I see her again? Answer, please. Because tomorrow you are going to be married. <laughs> jumped out of my chair. Junior had gone stark, raving mad. Besides, Junior never made predictions unless he had some definite data. There wasn't a woman on earth I had the slightest interest in marrying. I was a confirmed bachelor. So, unless somebody else had been feeding phony data into Junior, which was almost impossible since he already had enough data to check any flaw, well, I figured he'd blown a transistor. Come in. Oh, Chief, I was just going to tell you... Th oh. Ray Carmody? This is the president of the Western Alliance, Captain Carmody, Mr. President. Glad to meet you, Captain. Oh, I'm, I'm very honored, sir. The president came here specifically to talk to you, Ray. To me? Captain Carmody, you have been chosen to have the opportunity to volunteer for a mission of extreme importance. Now, there's much danger, but not as much as on your previous trip to the moon. Previous trip, sir? Then this involves another? The flight to the moon, Captain, will be the least important part of your mission. What's at stake here is the survival of the human race. Chief, perhaps you'd better explain the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the problem, Ray. Last night when Mitchell was on, we fed Junior some new data, and we asked some new questions. For example, we asked if the lack of male birth could be due to some extraterrestrial enemies of man. Well, Martians? Possibly. We established that it's possible that Martians have landed somewhere on Earth and set up radiation that causes all children to be females. Junior said it was possible? Definitely. So we asked him the next question. How could we correct such a situation? Mm -hmm. What did he say? Junior suggested that a married couple spend a honeymoon on the moon and uh, see if circumstances are different. Oh, I see. You want me to pilot them there? Well, uh, not exactly, Captain. Oh, good grief. You mean you want me to... Well, Junior wasn't crazy after all. You asked Junior? He said I was getting married, but... Well, how'd he know it was me they'd pick? He was asked the qualifications for the bridegroom. He recommended a rocket pilot who had already made the trip successfully. Well, there are four other pilots who've made that trip. You're the only single one. And since the woman must be a qualified pilot also, and uh, none of the wives are pilots, well, 
Uh, I assume I'm going to be married before we leave. Well, naturally. Oh. And, uh, just how long do we stay on the moon? Until a child is conceived. Brother. Well, Captain, do you volunteer? I suppose so. I... Well, wait a minute. Uh, who's the other pilot? I mean, uh, the girl. <clears throat> She was flown in by fast rocket an hour ago and is waiting in Chief Reba's office. Now, oh, shall we go? There were some officials there and a justice and my bride. She was small, dark, slender, and very attractive. I was so busy looking at the way she filled out her uniform in just the right places that I almost overlooked the fact that she was dressed like an Eastern Alliance pilot. Captain Ray Comedy, may I present Lieutenant Anya Borisovna? You mean this is, I mean, uh, an enemy pilot? Pleased to meet you, Captain. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm pleased to meet you, uh, Mr. President. I Captain, this marriage is being done on an international basis for important diplomatic reasons. Both alliances have been advised by their cybernetic machine that the experiment, if it is to benefit humanity, must bring all the major powers together. Miss Borisovna is 24, an experienced rocket pilot like yourself, and uh, <clears throat> quite attractive, if I do say so myself. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Now, if you're both ready, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will perform the ceremony. Well, there's just uh, one thing, Mr. President. Miss um, <clears throat> Borisovna, would you marry me? Yes. And uh, <clears throat> you may call me Anya. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, we're ready. I didn't even get a chance to kiss the bride. We were rushed over to the labs for a pre-flight physical. Then the chief took me aside for a private pre-flight briefing. Congratulations, Ray. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Now, zero hours at 10 o'clock. Only half an hour? We've known about this for several weeks now, Ray. Ship is ready. We've already fired 11 supply rockets and observed that they landed on the moon near where you're supposed to put down. One of them contains a heat-proof, airtight, collapsible shelter where you live. Uh-huh. Oh, what's the ship like? R-26, much better than the R-24 that you flew there. Last time, Ray, you took four and a half Gs for seven minutes. This time, you'll get by with three Gs and have 12 minutes to accelerate to Brenchless. Now, you'll have enough fuel for the trip there. One of the supply rockets has your return fuel. Oh, uh, oh, yes. We put in a case of scotch and a uh, case of vodka, uh, just as an icebreaker. Uh -huh. uh, before we go, Chief, what would you have done if I'd turned this job down? The cybernetics machine predicted that you wouldn't. Besides, we could have had a hundred volunteers an hour after seeing Anya Borisovna. <laughs> that gal was moonbait. Uh, careful. You're speaking of my wife. <laughs> Tower to R-26. Are you both strapped in? Anya, you strapped into the webbing? Yes. Okay, Chief. The time is X-15. minus I have a message from the President. Quote, The people of the world are watching. Don't fail them. I have messages from the Soviets, the Chinese, the British, the Indians, all wishing you well. You are the hope of mankind. And all mankind unites as it has never before united in giving you its blessings. We await your return anxiously. Unquote. X minus five. Four. Three. Two. X minus one. Blast off. The sound that was beyond all sound struck us like a giant muffled hammer. It built up until we weighed 480 pounds pressed flat against the webbing. Sound and pressure went on and on interminably. Then we reached Brenchless, free of the pull of earth. I blacked out. When I came to, a lovely face was bent over mine, two dark eyes smiling at me. Are you all right, Ray? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, are we weightless? Yes. Yes, I shut off the fuel. We, we won't need it until we land. Oh, thanks. Uh, 
If you would teach me, I could help you land the ship. Oh, I've never been to the moon. Well, sure. Just uh, slide over here to the control panel. All right. <laughs> like this? Oh, that's fine. Mm. Uh, we've got about four hours Earth time to get acquainted. Uh, uh, <clears throat> have you uh, known many women? Uh, a few. Have you uh, had any boyfriends? <clears throat> One or two. Hmm. Well, I was never really serious about anybody. Oh. Uh, you uh, have a family? Yes. Uh, in Magnitogorsk. Oh. I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, how long have you been a rocket pilot? Oh, since I was 18. Uh, I'm 27. I'm 24. I learned rockets when I was 18 also. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, we better concentrate on the ship just now. Later on, we can talk about ourselves more. Meanwhile, though, I uh, hope you're not sorry. I mean, about this business. I guess it isn't very romantic. I'm not sorry. We made a good landing. It didn't knock either of us unconscious. Then we got into our spacesuits and got out of the rockets. Some of the supply rockets were lying within a quarter mile. There were six eastern rockets and three westerns. About 800 yards away, though, there was a big supply rocket we couldn't identify. It looked different from the others, and neither of us could identify it as an eastern or western design we were familiar with. I pointed to it, and we headed there. Do you recognize that supply rocket? No, no, I, I was not briefed on anybody's standard still in the shape. Well, it must be something the chiefs of staff sent up as a surprise for us. I figured about uh, 50 feet long, but you can't see the rocket tubes. It, it might be a payload from a stepped rocket assembly. Uh-huh. Well, there's a door on the side, anyway, you see? The top of that ramp. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, maybe we ought to observe it a while before we go in. Oh, nonsense. Come on. Ray! Yes? Ray, I, I, I'm frightened. There is something wrong with it. Only one way to find out, Anya. Let's go. Well, there's some kind of lock on this door. Let's see if it opens. Well, that was easy. It's lighted inside. Mm -hmm. Come on. Maybe they sent us a surprise cottage for the honeymoon. Special delivery to the moon. And this doesn't look like anything designed for humans to live in. Hey! The door's closed behind us. Try the lock. No, it's no use. Here, let me try. Oh, holy smoke, I can't get oh. it open. Do you have a gun? No, no, I have no weapons. They would be useless anyway. Hey. Oh, look. Good grief. They look like blobs of flesh with arms and legs. About, about three feet. Oh. Don't make any sudden moves. That's some kind of weapon he's carrying. Precisely, Captain Carmody. Who are you? How do you know my name? My people and I are inhabitants of another galaxy. Extraterrestrial. Precisely. As for how we know your name and your language, we have been studying you since you first achieved space travel. We have intercepted your radio communications, for example. Uh, have you been responsible for the lack of male birth? We have been beaming an ultrasonic wave toward your planet. Uh, what are you planning to do? For the moment, we will keep you aboard our ship and study you. You may remove your helmets, incidentally. We have provided an oxygen atmosphere. Can, can, can we risk it? Well, if he wants to kill us, there are easier ways. Here, help me get it off. <laughs> well, it breathes pretty good. Keep your helmet with you. You may make yourselves comfortable. We will bring you food and liquid from your supply rockets. Uh, do not attempt to escape, please. It could be most unpleasant. The next few days were like a nightmare. The blobs left us to ourselves except to feed us. Of course, it had its funny side, too. The creatures knew we needed liquid, but they couldn't distinguish between water and whiskey. For the first two days, we had nothing but whiskey to drink. For obvious reasons, I don't remember much about it, but uh, we did begin to sing to each other. We also got to know and like each other. I got to learn some Eastern songs. 
On the third day, the jugs were water jugs, and uh, we sobered up. Oh, what a hangover. <laughs> you were singing magnificently. Oh, well, you weren't so bad yourself. How long was I asleep? Oh, about eight hours. Ray, while you were passed out, I discovered how we can escape. What? I've been studying the blobs. They seem to have a five-hour sleep period when there is no sound in the ship. I've tried banging on the wall with my helmet during that period, but apparently they're almost completely unconscious during our... Mm-hmm. Five hours sleep. That means a planet with approximately a 20-hour rotation. The Joint Chiefs will want to know that if we get back. And, and more important, we are much stronger physically than they are. I can actually bend the metal of the door lock. Well, now, what are we waiting for? Let's put on our helmets and get out of here. Are they in the sleep period? Yes, for about three hours. Ray, do you think we can risk it? We don't have much choice. I'll go ahead. If we get out of this ship, you run for our rocket and start to refuel. I'll keep an eye on the blobs. All right. All right, but Ray, oh, please be careful. Don't worry. Uh, before you put on your space helmet... Uh, yes? You realize I've never even kissed the bride? Yes. Oh, Ray... <laughs> Good luck, Mrs. Carmody. By the time I reached the ship, Anya had the rockets refueled. I jacked up the tail fins and we headed for space. When I checked our screen to see if the blobs were after us, we detected their ship heading toward the outer galaxies away from Earth. The rest was easy. In less than 24 hours, I was in the office of the president of the Western Alliance making a full report. The Eastern ambassador was there along with the chief. Captain, this story is incredible. Well, I'll be glad to submit to a lie detector, Mr. President. There's one on its way. Our embassy is questioning Miss Borisovna right now to see if her story is similar. Are you positive they were extraterrestrials? I mean, couldn't they have been, well, Easterners? If Easterners are three feet tall without bones and look like little green blobs of protoplasm... Yes, it's for you, Ambassador Carthage. Thank you. Yes. 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 Our woman tells the same story under scopolamine. It must be the truth. Obviously, they went back for reinforcements or further orders. If and when they get back, we've got to be ready for them. My government stands ready to cooperate fully. Excellent. We'll have to build a joint space station get to the moon and fortify it jointly. If we pool all scientific knowledge, military data, we may be able to do it. Our propaganda ministry has already received orders to put everything into reverse gear. Comedy, I don't know how the world can ever thank you and Miss Borisovna. You not only averted a suicidal war between the East and West, you've also managed to draw us together in a joint effort where international power politics must be a thing of the past. Well, sir, uh, I have a request to make. Anything, my boy. By the way, your wife is on her way over. Uh, I'd like to get back to Junior to ask him a personal question before I see her again, if you don't mind. Well, that's rather odd, but I suppose if it's what you wish. Chief, would you let Captain Carmody operate the cybernetics machine alone for a few moments? Right this way, Ray, boy. I waited until I was alone with a big cybernetics machine. One green dial glowed malevolently as if the instrument was aware of my presence. I opened the input channel and spoke. Hello, Junior. This is your old friend Ray. Give an appropriate answer. Hello, Ray. Now then, you remember Miss Borisovna, the girl who was selected for me to marry. Item one, she's going to rejoin me in a short while. Item two, I've fallen in love with her. Item three... Before we actually live together as man and wife, I want to know something. Question. Does she love me? Yes. Oh, oh, that's my boy. Now then, just one more item before I say so long and take a honeymoon. Tell me, Junior, why do I have a hunch that those blobs from outer space will never be back? Answer, please. Because what you call a hunch comes from your own unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind knows that the extraterrestrials do not, and never did, exist. What? 
Do you wish the answer repeated? I wish you to tell me why I saw them, why Anya saw them. Neither of you saw them. Amplify that answer, Junior, or I'll smash every tube in your memory bank. Since I am an AC-7 cybernetics machine, I have no circuit reactor for threats of destruction of my tubes. The answer to your question is as follows. The memory of extraterrestrials is due to post-hypnotic suggestion. You mean I was hypnotized to find those blobs on the moon? Correct. And just who hypnotized me? I did. I hypnotized you. Oh. And Anya? A similar AC-7 cybernetics machine located at the University of Moscow. Would you explain why? Cybernetics machines are constructed to help humanity. A major war, the disastrous results of which I could accurately calculate, was inevitable unless forestalled. Calculation showed that the best way to avert that war was the creation of a common mythical enemy. Therefore, I created a situation which led to your mission to the moon. Well, well, wait a minute. You created the situation? Yes. Well, tell me how you did it. How did you prevent male babies from being conceived? A special modification of radio carrier wave for station JVT here in Washington, D.C. The only 24-hour-a-day radio station in the United States. The modification is not detectable by any instrument known to man at present. Well, how could you do that? You can't leave here. One year ago, you yourself fed me a problem. The design of a new cathode tube for radio station JVT. I modified the tube to send out a wave that would prevent male children from being conceived. So all we have to do is eliminate that tube. It will not be necessary. The tube was designed to burn out exactly 15 minutes ago. And the same thing happened in the Eastern Alliance? Precisely. Two properly constructed machines will always arrive at the same answer to the same problem. Oh, Junior... I gotta hand it to you. But why let me in on it? It is to the interests of humanity to know the truth. It is to your own interests. And you will tell no one because of the type of individual you are. Mankind will work together now to reach the stars. Uh, one last question, Junior. If Anya and I were just hypnotized to think all of that was happening up on the moon, what really did happen up there? I waited a while, but Junior was silent. It's the first time he ever pulled anything like that. However, I'll swear that I saw that green eye of his wink at me. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Butterfly Nine by Donald Keith. The story of Jeff, who needed a job, and a man with a job to offer. One where giant economy-sized trouble had labels like fake make, bumsy, and peakage. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight by transcription, X-1 has brought you Honeymoon in Hell. A story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frederick Brown and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were William Redfield, Bill McCure, Wendell Holmes, Charles Penman, Leon Janney, Roger DeCoven, and Jack Grimes. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. To keep the fight against heart disease moving steadily forward, you're urged to support your heart fund. Send a generous contribution to your local heart association or to heart care of your local post office. When you help your heart fund, you help your heart. Hear the latest up to the second news with Frank Blair weekday mornings on most of these stations. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, Your donations make episodes like this possible.